and one. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Author on Author, my uh, bi-monthly series where I introduce an author from Saskatchewan to an author from BC, and I bring them together to have a fantastic conversation. My name is Daniel Ramadan. I am the writer in residence at the Saskatoon Public Library. I'm a Syrian Canadian author, public speaker, and an LGBTQ refugees activist. But today, it's not about me whatsoever. But before I start by introducing my fantastic guests for today, I want to acknowledge uh, the unceded territories that I am right, uh, I'm, I'm broadcasting from. I'm bro broadcasting from the uh, territories of the Muskim, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people, the Coast Salish people, uh, in the place that we call Vancouver. I'm also virtually uh, broadcasting from the Saskatoon Public Library, which is on Treaty 6. And I would like to acknowledge all of those lands, lands that are um, belonging to the First Nations people since the beginning of time, and that I am an uninvited guest on those lands, that I arrived here as a refugee, and yet I felt the most welcomed and the most uh, homely around folks who welcomed me and loved me from the First Nations uh, communities. Author and Author. Author and Author is bi-monthly. It's a series where I bring somebody from BC and another person from Saskatchewan and I sit them together and I see the magic happen. And today I have two amazing, dear to my heart authors that I'm dying, dying to introduce to you. I have from BC, Amber Dawn. And from Saskatchewan, I have Tanel K. Uh, Campbell. I'm hoping that I said the name correctly. Tanel uh, <laughs> K. Campbell is coming to us from the res in Saskatchewan, and Amber Dawn is coming from Vancouver, uh, BC. Let me read you their bio before we go further. Uh, Amber Dawn is a writer and creative facilitator living on the unceded territories of the Muskim, Squamish, and tsleil First Nations, Vancouver, Canada. Her debut novel, novel, Sub Rosa, in 2010, won the Lambda Literary Award for Debut Lesbian Fiction and the Writers Trust of Canada, D uh, Dane uh, Oglevy Prize. Her memoir, How Poetry Saved My Life, A Hustler's Memoir, 2013, won the Vancouver's Book Award. Her poetry collection, Where the, Word End, uh, Where the Words End and My Body Begins, 2015, was a finalist for the BC Book Dorothy Lifsey, Lifsey Poetry Prize. Her second novel, Sodom Road Exit, came out in 2018, and it's one of my favorite books that came out that year, uh, was a finalist for the Lambda Literary Award for Lesbian Fiction, the BC book uh, Ethel Wilson Fiction Prize, and a Sunburst Award for the Excellence in Canadian Literature of the Fantastic. She is an editor of three novel uh, anthologies, uh, with a rouge tongue, femme write poetry, uh, first of the spider woman, fear and queer desire, and hustler verse, an anthology of sex workers poetry. All her books are published with Arsenal Pol uh, Pulp Press. She teaches creative writing at Douglas uh, College, as well as guest mentors at several drop-in community-driven spaces in the downtown east side, an area impacted by poverty-related issues and beloved for its uh, tenacity and creativity. I know that Amber Dawn is uh, an icon in BC and across Canada, and I'm so, so thankful to have her here. She is one of my dearest friends. So hi, Amber, thank you so much for being here today. All right, we move on to Tanel K. Campbell, who I met in um, Horsjaw, Horsjaw, Moosejaw, Moosejaw, God, that was <laughs> Horsjaw, oh my God. <laughs> I met in Moosejaw, we were invited to a festival there together, Horsjaw, God, God, kill me now. Uh, <laughs> She uh, uh, read poetry that day and I just fell in love. And then I remember just hanging out with her for two days straight and just wanting more. So I'm so happy to have you here, uh, Tinel. Uh, Tinel K. Campbell is a Dean Maytees author and photographer from English River First Nations, Saskatchewan. 
She completed her MFA in creative writing from UBC and is enrolled in her PhD at the University of Saskatchewan. Uh, her, her poetry book, Indian Love Poems, hashtag Indian Love Poems, uh, Signature Editions 2017, is an award-winning collection of poetry that focuses on indigenous erotica, using humor and storytelling to reclaim and explore ideas of indigenous sexuality. She's also the artist uh, Sweet Moon Photography and the co-creator co of T and Bannock. She currently resides in Saskatchewan. She also has a book coming out soon, I hear from Arsenal uh, Pulp Press. So we have two folks coming out uh, from Arsenal Pulp Press, who is a fantastic BC um, uh, based publisher. So uh, heads up to that. And now I'm going to leave you folks to read. So how about we start with you, Tinel? Are you ready to give us some of your magic? <laughs> I'm still hung up on horse jaw. <laughs> 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 I was like, that's forever in my mind now. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I feel like I'm going to live through that embarrassment for the rest of my life. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Well, a shout out to the people in Musja. I am. I actually <laughs> liked my the festival over there. We had a great time there for sure. <laughs> we did. We did. Uh, man, so good. Um, just a quick heads up. Um, it's Tenil, and I didn't correct you before because it sounds so pretty. And I was like, Tenil, that's not your name, though. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Tenil. I I appreciate the correction, though. I've been called Tamali, so I mean, you were right on there. <laughs> I was like, this is fine. I can handle this. <laughs> oh, I was called once Ramada. And I'm like, I'm not a hotel chain. Come down. <laughs> You're like, I'm welcoming, but not that welcoming. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to my lobby. No. <laughs> okay. Right, go um, I'm going <laughs> to... Oh, okay, I'm ready. I'm going to read a bit from the newest collection, which is called Naidi Nezu which means good medicine in Dene. And um, like, I always let people know that I actually, I don't speak Dene, I don't speak Cree, I'm not a language speaker, but it was very important for me to work with my community to keep Dene and Cree within the book. And it's just now on me to like learn how to pronounce things properly, which is, you know, humbling, but worth it. <laughs> that is my, my little spiel. And... None of these poems are titled because why title anything these days? <laughs> Here we go. Um, Snagging while indigenous means road trips from res to res, 100 miles, a story in the making. Meeting grandparents, cousins, and aunties because there are no secrets among family. Snaking while well indigenous means bringing dry meat across borders, jars of canned fish, clinking in the back seat, bags of frozen blueberries, waiting to be handed to relations, ancient bribes for modern flirtations. Snaking while well indigenous means DMs and double taps and casually saying, hey, I was just in the neighborhood. We should hang out. I know your cousin. <laughs> I wrote this because um, obviously, and I think anybody can understand this, like how far we were willing to travel for a crush, for a like. I never understand those people who are like, oh my God, you're 10 minutes across town. I can't come see you. Like I've had men fly across the country. <laughs> you put the effort in and I find indigenous people put that effort in. And it always reminds me of uh, those boyfriends back in the day, the innocent days, when our parents had to drive us to meet each other and our parents would come with like gifts for each other's family. <laughs> I know. And I'm still good friends with a couple of these men's families today because of this, this little tradition. Like, remember we used to always get good berries from them. <laughs> I actually once traveled across the border from Syria to Lebanon when I was 18, lied on the border and said that I'm old enough to cross for a crush in Beirut. 
See? So cross countries, I tell you. <laughs> like cross those colonial lines. We got this. <laughs> oh, this one. Sorry, I'm not sorry, but for every poem that I read, I generally have a story that I like to tell with it. I just think it makes it like more inclusive and more fun for me. All right. You look like trouble and you know it. Tall and lean, head cocked just so. I can taste you already, northern accent dripping from tongue and lips. You look like morning regrets, the shuffling of clothes, the lost bra, the headache, trying to remember where I am and what your name is. You look like someone who will text that I'm beautiful, captivating like northern lights, sparkling like a blanket of stars like someone who has those words on copy and paste. When I say hockey boys, I think you'll understand what I mean. <laughs> that's, all, that's all the context we need. That's all the context we need. You say as you have a Canadian's um, chair right behind you. <laughs> Well, I'm at my parents' house, right? So, like, old Montreal, all hockey players, we all grew up at the rink. Like, when I say, like, a Montreal fan, <laughs> the mouse pad is Montreal. It's hilarious out here. And I was like, either I'm very vintage right now, or, like, we're not sure. <laughs> uh, oh, this is a pretty one. I want to taste your language as you whisper it into my mouth. Let my tongue lick and suck your vowels and consonants. You make me want to slow dance under moonlight and snowflakes, hand tangled in your hair, led down into heartbreak and hope. Make me your fry bread. Make me your Indian corn soup. Make me your candied salmon. Make me your strawberry anything. Feast on me. Mm. as like a language speaker who doesn't speak the amount of love and lust i have for indigenous people and people who speak their languages mm -hmm. ooh, like i don't care if you're ordering pizza just speak your language <laughs> oh this one i'm going through like my memories with these i'm like oh i miss him <laughs> Oh, <laughs> that's okay. There's a lot of them to miss. <laughs> okay. I uh, grew up to my own heart. <laughs> right? I'm like, this is just me keeping track of them. This is one way. Uh, <laughs> that one's problematic. Let's read it. Let's read it. <laughs> All right. Um, do you think of her when you were so at home between my thighs, my accent thick in your ears, Nezul? Do you think of her when you let me kiss your neck, leaving lipstick and love marks on your flesh? When I take you into my mouth and you moan, head rolled back, hand fisted in my hair? When you caress my breasts, biting oh so softly, just to hear me gasp? Do you think of her when you tell me you're single? <laughs> oh. Your end lines are just like a real, it's all like soft touches and then there's a little punch right at the end. Like so many of the end lines of your poem, I'm just like, ooh. <laughs> Thank you. That is so deliberate. I think it's like from a lifetime of fighting and wanting to get the like last word in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you've definitely replicated that in poetry to a beautiful effect. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, man. Oh, this one. Oh, my God. I'm going to tell you guys a story about this guy uh, uh, after the poem. <laughs> yeah, me just spilling all the tea but never naming names, so it's safe. The last time we kissed, you pushed my body against the deck wall. I remember the scratchy wood at my back. You pulled my hips closer to yours. 
fingers against my skin, making me ache. You still tasted like last night of laughter and drinks. And I fell into lust again and again and again. Moaning against your mouth, my arms around your neck, pulling you deeper, harder, faster. I ran fingernails through your sunshine blonde hair, the sky reflecting the color of your eyes, looking into mine and I had to look away, grinning, blushing, dripping. You make me feel all the ways I don't wanna feel. And I know that was the last time because I won't watch you walk away anymore. You know? There's a lot of storytelling in your poetry that I really appreciate. Like you start with a scene that is um, erotic in nature, but then you add that last line and it just takes it to a whole new level. It's, it's I completely agree with Amber Donahue. Oh, thank you. I know, I fell into like, I don't know, part of like my backstory and my romance and my history is that I was in a long-term relationship for 12 years. And then I emerged out of that and like healed my way with my vagina apparently. And <laughs> like, no shame, I love it. Uh, <laughs> and learned so much about myself and confronting my own internalized like ideas of what proper sexuality is and just blasting my own mind with knowledge and pushing myself to become like a better person and more aware and more open and like it's been hard and it's been like the kind of growth that that intimate space takes and the kind of like both welcoming and like education that I've had oh changes changes galore and during this time I've like honestly kept my heart pretty guarded like not my body but my heart and this was one guy that I, I just felt like I tumbled into it like a puppy and I was just like oh my god you're so sparkly like <laughs> Whew. <laughs> like you listen like the bare minimum for like my partner's apparently like you listen to me so I love you <laughs> too real <laughs> and, um, so I like just tumbled but he was like damaged in his own way and so often it was just so toxic of like getting back together getting back together getting back together and then finally I was just like we can't do this and it was like, this is his final goodbye. And he didn't know it was goodbye. And I knew it was goodbye. And I was just like, we are writing about this because that's the last time I've ever really seen him. And I was like, that was perfect. That was great. I won, <laughs> which I mean, isn't always the goal. But when your heart's involved, it feels kind of better sometimes to win. <laughs> oh, how much time do I have left? Danny. Uh, let's go for one last poem and then we move on to Amber Dawn. Is that okay with you? Yes. Yes. Awesome. I want to read this one because it's something we need to talk about. Okay. Um, indigenous academia makes me ache. Talk with me. I want to hear vowels dripping from your tongue, mixing the words from your nation. It doesn't matter, I don't yet understand, I will learn. We're coming in waves, passing stories where we've been and where we're going. A hidden library nook, a quiet reading room, a safe place to go, surrounded with people who laugh like you. Old travel knowledge for new ways. We're reclaiming space, singing songs from the land, low notes echoing down hallways, hand drum in your lap, long lean fingers constantly tapping the beat you constantly hear making me dream beyond ivory towers. We're taking it, making it visibly, undeniably, irrevocably indigenous. Mm. God, I need a cold glass of water after this. It was so <laughs> good. <laughs> I know, well, I don't know. I think we all like understand that of how isolating and lonely academia could be. Mm -hmm. and I'm in year too much and, <laughs> yeah. and like damn and I've cultivated a beautiful great safe space for me mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it's it's hard and it's lonely and the higher you up you get the paler it gets and that's just the way it is right now 
And I was just like, you know, it doesn't where it's okay for us to dream for something better, something more, something, something where we can mix in specifically like our indigenous knowledge with this very Western colonial way of being in an academic space. And I was just like, it's not the perfect way, but it's a way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I mean, thank you so much for that reading. That was stunning, to be honest. And I felt it like in my bones. It was, it was funny because I'm like, oh, it's getting hot in here. But <laughs> I was like, oh, I don't know how I feel about this. It, it was really fantastic. I really appreciate that reading. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right. So uh, Amber Dawn, uh, so just because I do this every single time that I talk about Amber Dawn, Amber Dawn is literally the first person in the Can Canadian literature scene to ever say hi to me. I, oh. this weird kid out there trying to start my career, trying to write and stuff like that. And Amber Dawn comes to me with this like love that I've never, like I, I didn't know if I, if I if I deserved it at the time, I was just like sitting there minding my own business, being like this queer kid trying to join the word. And Amber Dawn was like, "Here, kid, let me show you the way." It just like took me in. I just I I adore you. I love you. I think you are fantastic in every way. And I cannot wait to hear what you have to read for us today. Oh, thank you so much. God, what a love fest this is. It's <laughs> it's just it's warming my heart. Um, and um, Tanil, if you'll allow me in the future, I can't wait to call you Dr. Queen Genius Tanil K. Campbell <laughs> as your full title. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not going to be mad at that. Please do. <laughs> okay. I'll start calling you doctor immediately, by the way. Like, we don't need to wait for you to have like, you know. No, we have, we have to wait. But okay. I will definitely not be one of those people who are like, no, 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 just call me Tanil. I'll be like, no. Like fucking eight years of my life, like please yeah. moan it. <laughs> Dr. Campbell, if you're nasty. I can you need to get t-shirts that say Dr. Campbell if you're nasty for your defense. Like that's <laughs> Oh my god, I'm like tearing here. <laughs> All right, that's the yeah, ever done. Okay, <laughs> um, so I'm going to read three poems for you today. I'm going to start with um, the newest poem, something I wrote this winter, and I'm going to take us back, way back to something I wrote in 1998, so a poem that I wrote in my creative writing undergrad at UBC, um, and all three in one way or another sort of address uh, queer women finding each other. Um, you know, finding each other for attraction and intimacy, for love, for family, um, through, if I may quote you, Tanil, through healing ourselves with our vaginas, um, and, and, and for safety as well. Um, so the one I'm starting with is something I wrote this winter um, that's going to be published in an anthology called Here and Now, an anthology of queer Italian Canadian writing um, edited by Dr. Lucia uh, Canton. And it's called Pre Preliminal Rights. Quel piccolo paese means this small place where I met a man who knew a man who arranged my stay at the empty Carmelite monastery. I chose the room with the tall wood door that locked from the inside. After work was done, all the good men of Pocentro Abruzzo wolf packed the cafe chairs, shoulder to shoulder around the piazza fountain. One man claimed he knew my nonno. One man followed me back to the monastery each night. One man shouted, bel culetto, nice ass, each time I passed. One man told me the only appropriate response to bel culetto is grazie, or perhaps a sassy lo so, I know it. One of the few phrases I know so well that my subconscious has spoken it back to me in dreams is lasciami stare, it means leave me alone. 
One man sang me a nasal wedding march. One man threw copper coins at my feet. One man convinced me to ride an Appaloosa through Paso San Leonardo, where I heard a ringing bell on the other side of the mountain, ringing and ringing. And for reasons I cannot explain, the sound made me cry in measured fits and the horse pulled back her spotted ears. One man warned me not to mention my nono's cognome, his last name. One man brought me homemade wine with ratafia. One man offered to take me dancing in the city. One of the few phrases I know so well that my subconscious has spoken it back to me in dreams is volio ballare. I want to dance. I drank too much at the club in Pescara and found queer women there in that muddled buzz. We danced in a tight circle like the four oxen in Aesop's fables, the men in the club, lions, circling, prowling. These queer women listed the times homophobia nearly killed them. I understood perfectly when they asked what Canada is like, is there liberta per lesbi in Canada? I ferociously recorded the words that I misunderstood in a notebook as if I might one day retroactively follow meaning. I couldn't call upon language fast enough to be of any comfort. I couldn't call upon language well enough to belong. The next day, my hangover clotted my tongue and I spoke to no one. In my notebook, drawn up in a drunken hand, the words, Siamo più sicure se restiamo insieme. We will be safer if we stick together. One man slipped me a strip of condoms in a folded napkin. One man pulled my hair when I called him stonato. One man spit three times whenever I took a table at the cafe. After work was done, those with family resting in the high walls of Pacentra Abruzzo set their eyes against the sunset and climbed the cemetery steps to the lynchian moss flecked feet of Mary. I too have kissed the virgin stone toes. Kissing a woman's feet is a scaramanzia, I understand. I went further up the mountain past the bony Nona who stopped hanging white sheets on the line to warn me of wild boar in the woods, past large paw stray dogs that appeared and vanished along the path, past the almighty cicadas that keened in the warp heat, higher still I heard antelopes bleat, or I heard something that moans like a fiend. I beat a silver birch branch against the dry rock determined to protect myself. For as long as I can remember, I've been afraid of men. But there, up the mountain, I found the shepherd's cave that I had once seen in an old photograph. Ancient stone, each one the size of a human skull. I edged my way in carefully as if the stone might wake. I knelt before the altar where someone had recently placed a new gold embossed Holy Mary card and a wax candle. Behind her other holy cards grayed against the wet cave wall. Gray Gabriel, Gray Maggi, Gray John. I prayed. Not the rosary, psalms, or any grace I learned as a girl. I prayed, please, I don't want to be afraid anymore. I'll do anything. Please, oh paura, paura lascia me, fear, leave me, please, unafraid, please. <laughs> wow. Um, I, I really um, get kind of pissed off that um, just patriarchal machismo that's still so prevalent in Italy and also with um, Italian settlers here has um, just kind of fucked me up, like starting with my nono's disownment of me when I came out. And, and you know, it, it really is pervasive every time I visited Italy. 
Um, so yeah, you know, just keep trying to find Italian queers and talk about it, I guess. Um, so I'm gonna radically shift tone and read a love poem. And um, this comes from my poetry collection, Where the Words End and My Body Begins, um, which is a book of form poetry. It's, it's a glossa form. It's a, a, a 16th century uh, Spanish form. And uh, we don't need to talk about the form very much, but what I'd love to tell you about the form is to get started with writing a glossa, um, the poet chooses a quatrain, so four lines from another poet and sort of works intertextually with those four lines. Uh, so for this particular poem, um, I chose a quatrain um, from Hamilton, um, then known as the poet Jane Eaton Hamilton. Um, and those lines read, I watched your breast, which was fuller than the night on my for porch when I first undid your buttons. The sheet beneath you was green. It was almost our anniversary. Um, and I wrote this poem uh, for my wife uh, on our sixth anniversary. I watched your breast, which is fuller than when we met. I thought you were starving raw boned butch lap like a wooden chair. I vowed to feed you everything I had, tender a feast, charm your tongue with salted green peas, drunken apricots, sweet sun tea. Gradually your ribs sank into the waxing flesh I'd come to know like my own. The night on my porch, when I first undid the milkmaid braid from my hair, my temples daubed with rose oil, baby powdered scalp, elder cedar crooning in the yard, early peonies, olfactory romance, June's warm spell and invitation to strip down. Our undressed bodies always allegory. Our love made us fabulous, we tell our story and tell it again when I tug your shirt sleeve, open your buttons, the sheet beneath you is green buffalo plaid, banked by patchwork quilts. This is our December bed, the yarn of our winters. Frost hugs the window, we wear goose flesh, yawning skin. You sing Frosty Le Bonhomme, and my heart becomes a snow globe. Each glittering snowflake chimes, I'm yours, I'm yours, I'm yours. It is almost our anniversary when northern flickers hammer our roof in the morning. Magnolia buds split their pink lips. I lick the same raindrop off the tip of your nose as I'd licked for the last six springs. It still tastes like a vow, but today I will write a poem to mark the occasion. Thank you. Together, sure. twelve years. Woo! <laughs> I, uh, it's there's such beauty in the way that you pull those like sensory details in your poetry. Like you take us there. You just like take us by the neck, just like carry me by the collar and throw me into the world of your poetry. It is so beautiful. Just like a mama cat, like just <laughs> up to the neck and take you along. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never be a doctor, but I could be Mama Cat Amber Dawn if someone oh. cared to call me that. <laughs> <laughs> I will. I will. Next time that I introduce you, I'm going to say that exactly. <laughs> um, I'm going to finish with another love poem, um, a, a little less um, certain <laughs> in its love poemness. Um, and it is a poem that I wrote way back. It's one of the first poems I ever wrote. I wrote it in 1998. I was a brand new undergrad at UBC's creative writing program, um, a department I know we all have had experiences with. So this one is dedicated to both of you. There are romances that stick to that song, that baby toe, that particular hue of blue, that constant twister of cherry blossoms in April on the corner of second and commercial. Romances that stick to you long after they've ended. And then there are romances you barely remember at all. They turn up in your memory like a key found in a 
pocket of a coat you haven't worn for ages, or a phone number scribbled on the last page of the self-help book written by the Buddhist nun from Los Angeles, which you always fell asleep while reading, even while on the bus, and there is no name beside that phone number. I don't remember the girl whose father's front yard was strewn with Studebaker and Bugatti skeletons, a battleground of chrome bones, rusted limbs reaching for my ankles as I snuck to her window at night. Her own car was a Galaxy Ford 500, mint green with a paler mint interior, no radio, only distance between us, those bucket seats so far apart. The crickets desperate him along the back roads we drove, the sour smell of sumac growing in the ditch, her cigarette smoke floating above her head like a halo that refused to wholly commit itself to her head. I remember, but not her eyes, her clothes, the words she must have said or didn't. I imagine this girl, now a woman, has also forgotten the sterling silver e eagle earrings I wore every day that summer, the way August poured freckles on my shoulders and nose, that I worked the snow cone machine at a traveling fair, and if they were going to Montana next, I would go with them because I heard there was nothing but fields of sunflowers there. And I loved long drives how you can close your eyes and then open them and everything around you has changed. Thanks so much. Oh my That's God. <laughs> we're done. Thank you so much for that reading. Uh, as always, you deliver. And I love, love, love that about you. Um, I, oh God, like we have been at it for 45 minutes and I'm really like, I, I just want to spend hours with you folks, but I have prepared some questions. I'm just going to ask one or two. I don't know if we have the time for the 16 million questions that I will have for you. Uh, but how about I start with this one about intimacy. So in the world that we're living at the moment in, physical intimacy has been limited uh, for good reasons, of course. However, both of your poetry feels intimate. It feels intense in its need for human touch. And the narrative you bring is that of intentional, intentional connectivity. Hmm. What do you think, what do you think is the role that you have as a poet, if any, in navigating the lack of intimacy of our world right now? Is there, is there a space that you want to create for yourself in our world that you, for you to create a sense of intimacy that might fit with our, our current social distance status that we're living in? How about we start with you, Tineo? Tineo. <laughs> but not. <laughs> like, no, I'm still recovering from Amber Dawn's poetry. That was so beautiful. Hearing you read is such a gift. Oh, and I'm just, I'm still like a wash in memories and sensations that aren't even mine. Like it was so good. Ah, thank you. Like you inspire me to write longer and immerse myself in it in a way like that my poetry, like obviously is tongue in cheek and like very snap, like a hit and you're gone, right? Which is great and fine. I felt like I was there with you and it's just inspiring and you inspired me to go try something new. So thank you. Aww. So I can't answer these questions right now. <laughs> and for Dawn has to answer the question. Okay, first. okay. Um, yeah, I mean, we are at a time when every intimate gesture we need to think very carefully about, of course. Um, I, um, up until very recently lived with um, two children. So we lived together for a decade. Um, and, you know, living with children, you get a lot of questions. Kids are very inquisitive. Um, and the youngest and I were walking around last April, I wanna say we were walking through um, a rainy park, which we had been to a few times, very popular kind of like outdoor sort of landscaped Vancouver green space. Um, and they said to me, oh, I've never been here before. And I was like, no, we've 
actually been here quite a few times. It's just, there's no one here. Mm -hmm. And the emptiness of this during lockdown is probably um, making you not recognize the place because you're used to seeing like people walking their dogs and having a picnic over there. Um, so it, it looks different. Um, and they asked me, have you ever been through anything like this before? Which is a really common question. Like, um, like we're legacy queers. So like our kids are queer, we're queer. Like there's a legacy of queerness in our chosen family household. And, um, and so oftentimes when they've asked me, you know, have you had something like this happen to you before? I have some anecdotal knowledge I can perhaps share. Um, I got, and I was like, I have nothing. Like, I don't, I've never seen anything like this before. Um, like I have other hardships I've been through and I can, you know, we can talk survival strategies or like self-care strategies or reducing anxiety strategies, but no, you know. Um, so I think poetry is something that I turn to in times of doubt. Um, I don't know if the poet necessarily has a specific role, like that places a lot of pressure on an individual and that question like what's the artist's role during an absolute shitstorm gets asked of artists a lot and I'm like fuck our role is just to survive like everyone else um and to share resources when we got them um but I do think that poetry is a really interesting form to turn to um in times of crisis and in times of uncertainty because poetry is so nimble like it doesn't want to be any one thing um, it's, um, you know, it's like has freed itself of this colonial narrative, like who, what, when, where, why kind of sentence structure um, type of way of thinking. Um, and, and it's going back to feeling and, and senses, you know, like a poets are always rocking the five senses. We're always rocking like more of a um, emotional intelligence rather than a logistical, like, why did this happen kind of inquiries. Uh, we can ask those questions too, most certainly. Um, so yeah, I do think that poetry in the absence of physical intimacy, for whatever reason, can be a really, a really great place for us to turn to. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. I do. I, it's funny because I don't usually, I'm not a big poetry reader. Like I read a lot of poetry in Arabic, but I find English poetry to be a bit inaccessible to me mm -hmm. but um over the past while i have been reading a lot of poetry uh i'm i read gillian christmas book i, I read uh, cecily bell uh book i read um uh, jay simpson's book and and i found that there's a there's a quality like meditation in poetry it mm -hmm. felt very centering as i'm reading somebody else's poetry it just felt that way how do you feel about this to know Am I saying your name correctly? Tanelle. 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 Sorry. Sorry. I was like, are we? I'm thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, I agree with Amber also, Amber Dawn. I'm also about um the poet like not necessarily having a role because like that's a lot of onus. That's a lot of responsibility none of us want. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like we just trying to get through. And I was like, I was very curious over the last year um, because I'm also a mother. I have a nine-year-old daughter mm -hmm. and how intimacy has become like so centered. Like I will call her from her room, which she hates, but I'll be like, Eric, come here. And she's like, what? I'm like, give me a hug. <laughs> yeah. Like this calling in for like both physical touch and like emotional assurance mm -hmm. and how that's trapped, tra like change because um, I always kind of explain like my relationships is if I love you, I aggressively love you <laughs> and you know it. And so our friendships and kinship and relationships have shifted in such a way that like, I hate being on my phone, but now I'm constantly like texting and checking in and doing all these like little tiny things and trying on my end to actually respond because I'm a horrible texter too because <laughs> someone will text me and like five days later I'm like oh my god so funny ha 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 <laughs> like it was funny five days ago bitch pay attention <laughs> <laughs> so becoming a more emotionally aware person on my end too because I'm sitting there like am I sad or is it the mm -hmm. pandemic mm -hmm. 
like is this emotional turmoil mine or am i feeling everyone's collective grief mm-hmm. and kind of dissecting who i thought i was because i thought i thought i was like pretty happy go lucky and i'm like no no you're not when you have the moment to sit which we've all had too much time of like your perception of self changes and your perception of care changes and Oh, I think there's a lot, a lot of growth about intimacy and self that none of us were really prepared for or wanted. Mm-hmm. I could have gone on being ignorant. I'm saying that. <laughs> we did not need this year of growth. One hundred percent, my friend. One hundred percent. Yeah, there is there is that that moments that we are facing ourselves and looking into ourselves, which actually takes me right into my next question. Um, So we have been doing this for a good year now, all of us, and I don't know if I'm very happy about doing this. Um, I actually intentionally avoid being called a poet um, because there is a sense of fear that I get from how opened and accessible this internal dialogues that I have within within my, my mind when I sit down and write poetry. It just feels like I am writing, it's, it's, it's not even as like memoir is scary, but poetry is like a freaking Dracula. It's freaky. It's it's because in memoir you can sit down and you can tell bits and pieces and present information a certain way. In poetry, I feel sometimes that you just like stab yourself in the shoulder and see how you bleed. So <laughs> I I I fear it. I I it it scares me. Um but both of your work seems extremely brave. Um, It examines oneself, it examines one's history, it examines the place in the larger dynamics of the society that we live in. Um, So how do you, I would call both of you as brave women and how would you bring that bravery into uh, your poetry? How How do you deal with that binary between, let's call it a binary or maybe a spectrum between bravery and, and, caring for yourself as a poet, I would say. Mm. Neil, take it. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think it's only fair for Tenille to take it. <laughs> um, okay, okay. Um, um, I don't necessarily call myself a poet either. Um, I recently kind of leaned into this idea of a storyteller, a non-traditional storyteller, just because my stories take so many forms, like not just poetry, but fiction, not just fiction, but photography, not just photography, but blogging. Mm -hmm. Like these are all ways that we share and tell our stories. And I don't want to be just limited to just writing. Mm -hmm. So I'm just like, call me a storyteller, (laughs) but we'll see how that goes. Because, you know, you know, there's going to be like men in my DMs, like with their thick braids calling me not a storyteller. (laughs) And I'll be like, okay, cool. Cool, 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 Chad. Um, (laughs) (laughs) I just have to throw the shade out there. Hmm? Sorry, I was just saying, did we all have a Chad in our life that is eh, not the best of people? (laughs) Yes, I think we all have them. Like, and Mm -hmm. elder Chads are the worst. I'm just saying. (laughs) Chat. Um, but poetry and like the writing for me is medicine I don't necessarily know if it's so much bravery mm-hmm. as so much self-care as it is self-care mm-hmm. um, it allows me to process it allows me to heal it allows me to not carry it within me and bring it out even if nothing ever happens and no one ever sees it at least like this this uncertainty uncertainty is not festering within me and Mm -hmm. I felt like I've taken action because I figured out I'm a very action-based person even if it's just within me and it's something I have learned that I need to process and care for and it makes me a better, more solid person, thankfully. Mm. So is it bravery or is it so much as self-love? Mm. How do you feel about that, Amber Dawn? 
I mean, this is such a personal question to Neil and um, I'm like, have actually hissed like a cat when people have asked me really personal questions. <laughs> like I've been like, <sighs> but um, knowing that you might not want to um, field this question, would you say that writing poetry is part of like a larger process of like just getting close to yourself, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, you say self care, like is, is poetry like a step in a series of things that you're, you or, or another person exploring poetry might do for ourselves? Would you say mm. that? I think so. From, I can't say for everyone, obviously. I think for me, especially over this last year, um, I've been doing like this silly little thing, but it helps um, 10 minute free writings in the morning. Because for the last like five, six years, all my writing has been academic. Yeah. And ouch. <laughs> so I wanted to kind of just give myself a space where I could freely write and write about whatever and not be judged by it. And these 10 minute things honestly have been rolling out and have just kind of opened up discussions in my mind I didn't realize I need to have. And like I say, there's been so much growth than, from who I was like five, six years ago, but there's still so much to unpack. And mm -hmm. I'm on the res right now for a week, right? And in my city life, in my academic life, I have a very like left-leaning, liberal, open conversation on my like Facebook, on my Instagrams. Like we surround with ourselves with people who think and like us. But I'm on the res and it's a small you know, Catholic raised traditional reserve. And I'm going around like safely and like having smokes outside, like on people's patios and like hearing the tea about other people and hearing so much like shame being told in regards to like women's stories about women. And I'm like, oh, right. We're not all there. We're not all woke yet. We're not all we're not all there for stopping and not stopping and judging women. And so I feel like over the past week, me like confronting this with my friends and like with my relatives and my kin, like in the community have been either I'm going to get kicked out <laughs> or this new way of thinking has not new way, this open way of thinking has been dismissed or she's city now. And mm -hmm. so writing this week has just been this process of taking my traditional upbringings and picking them apart and dissecting them and seeing not necessarily what I want to keep and toss away, but how can I give cultural value and traditional knowledge and community knowledge of this area to my daughter? Cause it's where she comes from too, but still not let the negativity that surrounds sexuality and women and growth affect her. And the writing this week has just been pouring out of me. And like, mm -hmm. I'm coming away like 10 minutes, just like bawling. Like I didn't even realize I was crying. <laughs> mm -hmm. So for me, the poetry has definitely been a step of processing, a step, a step of healing, of writing down things I didn't know I was feeling. And it's mm -hmm. so helpful. And it wasn't even personal. And I'm like, I say that because it's like us three and I feel like we know each other. <laughs> but I trust, I trust. Uh, thank, but, well, thanks. <laughs> thanks for going there with that sort of add on that I <laughs> tailed to Danny's question. Um, you know, your and Danny, your question is about poetry and fear, essentially, you know, if you whittle your question down to what I'm hearing is like sort of its essence or the linchpin of that question. Um, and um, I fucking love fear. Like it's my blanket. It keeps me warm. I'm very custom to fear. I literally grew up afraid all the time on multiple levels, um, on a very personal safety level, um, but also culturally um, for what um, my family was um, willing to retain in terms of like Italian cultural um, identity, um, this idea of the unknown is really big to us. Like get in touch with the unknown as frequently as possible. Um, you know, being uncomfortable and not understanding things is part of life. Like there's kind of like a, a bitter and a sweet spectrum to that life. Um, and then being queer, being queer so young, like so 
young, I was just such a queer pervert. Like my mom had to have talks with me about trying to inappropriately touch my female teachers when I was a little kid. Like I was, so that was like, just made me feel afraid of myself too. Like, I'm like, there's something not right with me. Um, so fear was all around. And um, I understand some survivors, especially white survivors will try to figure out how to find like some kind of cure to that, you know, to try to like write ourselves and become like productive members of like capitalist society, um, which of course I've bought into too, and I'm privileged by too. But I also am like, no, fear is a huge part of my life, just like grief and um, poetry lets me get close to that more frequently than anything else in my daily life. Um, not only reading, not only writing it, but reading it, you know, like any of the poetry collections that I've read recently, there's always some uncertainty where I'm like, I'm not getting it. I don't, not sure what the poet's intention are. And like, just having to be okay with that and like to, in to learn to appreciate that feeling of uncertainty um, is, is wonderful. And, 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 and I would tail onto that, um, you know, for any, for any white listeners, like read poetry as much as you can, um, get, get a practice of listening deeply to something that you don't understand completely and fucking get comfortable and get right with that. Um, I would like to recommend that that can help us get right with ourselves, um, whatever whatever that means to any individual who's listening right now. Um, but I'm 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 up for fear. Like I'm gonna keep going with fear for as long as I can. Um, yeah. All right. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, what else can we do? Like we can't not be afraid. Like I, if you figured out how to not be afraid like I don't want to know you you know like <sighs> I mean I asked the question specifically because I didn't figure out how not to be afraid of poetry <laughs> there's I don't know if there's a there's a cure for fear I don't know if that is something that happens I think that there is moments of bravery maybe maybe the way that I created the question where I created the binary between bravery and fear. I don't think maybe the maybe the answer is that you can be fearful and brave at the same time. There's there's no reason for the two not to exist at the same time. And I'm going to be brave right now and cut this conversation because we have been going at it for an hour. And I love you folks. I do, I do, I do. I want to spend hours with you. But that's our time for tonight and tonight today. I don't know. I don't know when this is going to come out. So whenever you're watching it, I'm wishing you folks a very fantastic day, a very fantastic night. I hope you enjoyed the hour with uh, Tenille Campbell and Amber Dawn. Uh, I personally did. I laughed. I teared up. I was afraid and I was brave. I feel like we have been through a lot in this past hour. <laughs> um, so thank you so much to Amber Dawn. Thank you so much to Tenille Campbell. I really appreciate both of you so much, folks. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, for the folks who are watching, uh, as the writer in residence, I have this series, Author and Author, once every two months. Uh, I have another uh, series called Public Salon, which alternates. So next month, Public Salon invites three unpublished uh, young authors from, uh, well, unpublished young in their career. They don't actually have to be young in age. Uh, authors from Saskatchewan to read uh, to you folks. So come in, check it in. Uh, next month, I also run my uh, novel-ish series which I'm talking about tools of writing and specifically writing fiction and nonfiction. So check this out and until I see you next time, salamat. Bye. Bye Tamil. Bye. <laughs>